Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. Welcome back to another episode of Wild Turkey Science Podcast, and we're here today talking to Adam Butler, who is and hopefully I get this title right, Adam, the, the Turkey Program Coordinator. For, yes, sir, that is correct. For the Program Coordinator for the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Oh, I'm glad you said the rest of it because I couldn't remember at the moment whether it was Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks or Fisheries, Wildlife, and Parks. So Yeah, it gets confusing. Every state does it a little different. So I know yeah. you got you got to kind of keep that reference in the back of your head. Right. Yep. But, you know, Adam, it's your job, you know, to spend um, 365 days a year, you know, thinking about turkeys, not only in Mississippi, but um, you regularly convene and converse with turkey biologists from all over the country, both from other state agencies as well as academia. And um, we appreciate you coming on today to talk about some of your perspectives related to turkey population status in Mississippi and maybe um, discuss a little bit about season frameworks and how that relates back to wild turkey biology and sharing some of the data that you guys have been collecting um, at a statewide level for the past several years. Yeah, for sure, man. I, um, you know, I'm always quick to, to tell people, you know, I'm not just a turkey biologist. I was a turkey hunter way before I was a biologist and I'll be a turkey hunter way after. So it's not just, uh, it's not just my job. It's a personal passion of mine, which mm-hmm. I think is probably shared by a lot of, a lot of us in our profession. Um, but you know, I've, I've been a turkey hunter in Mississippi since I was a little kid. One of my earliest memories is, uh, watching my dad shoot a bird when I was about five years old and, uh, I've chased the things ever since. So <laughs> I, I, thinking about turkeys 365, that's a good way to put it. One way or the other, I'm thinking about them 365. Yeah. But now whether you get paid to clock, do it. Yeah. Whether you're on the clock or not. <laughs> No, I came from a similar place in life, you know, with, with uh, the influence. I remember really early on turkey hunting with my dad and grand, grandfather. But, uh, yeah, it's it's nice to talk to people like yourself. That, And, and I think that's a, one of the reasons that, that uh, a lot of the turkey folks have gotten into the business is exactly what you're saying is we grew up turkey hunting and we loved the resource and it led us down a path of, you know, of, of in our case, researching it in academia, in your case, uh, being the, the state program coordinator. Uh, and I just want to reiterate, there's a lot of value that comes from that perspective, you know, with biologists that grew up hunting the resource that they're now managing. There's a lot of perspective and same thing for research. A lot of the ideas and, and things that I think about come from my time on a deer stand or in a you know, on the side of a tree listening to turkeys. So, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think when you consider the frustrations with, um, especially trying to manage a resource like wild turkeys at a statewide level, um, you're not going to be able to, to maintain that level of devotion if you don't have an underlying passion for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, nobody goes into the wildlife profession to get rich. That's for sure. You've got <laughs> you to love it. Yeah. Um, but you, you're also dealing with, a resource and a constituency and you have the perspective of the constituency. Yeah. As that yeah. And so. I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because as we talk about harvest frameworks, um, I think a, a lot of times um, hunters and our constituents, you know, can, can view the biologist or the state agency as just, you know, some bureaucrat sitting in the Capitol building who are removed from sort of the end goal, which is to have more turkeys to hunt. But, uh, I, as much as I can, I try to uh, dissuade that notion, you know, um, you know, looking at our, our wildlife bureau staff here with uh, Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fishers and Parks. I mean, every single one of us is a hunter. So even though we our our role and our responsibility is policy and policy that affects hunters, you know, we're all looking at it through that lens as a hunter. 
mm-hmm. because it's so at the end of the day, it affects us too. And, and that, that really, you know, if we get into talking more about frameworks and stuff like that, that very much paints, you know, my perspective on it all. You know, there's, you know, every time you, you talk about, you know, doing something with harsh frameworks, that actually is going to affect people in the field, real people, real experiences, real memories that could be made, you know? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Maybe the best place to start is um, if you could just fill us in, especially for people that may not be as familiar with the state of Mississippi, kind of um, some background information on turkey populations and status over the years. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my, uh, I'm going to probably let my bias show a little bit here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from Mississippi, grew up here. Uh, went away uh, for a little while and came back. Uh, but, you know, I'm I'm really proud uh, to have the role I have because I, Mississippi, I think, uh, is is pretty prominent in the turkey world for a lot of reasons. Uh, I've heard it called a blue chip turkey state. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, Marcus, you being a fellow Mississippi State University alumni, you know, MSU has a, a real rich history of turkey research going back to Dr. George Hurst, you know, all the way back into the 80s. Um, if we talk about Dr. Kenimer, who most people will recognize his name from uh, his longtime association leading to NWTF, you know, he got his PhD at Mississippi State University working on turkeys. Um, and, you know, that rich tradition of, of, of turkey science continues here to this day. You know, just in the last decade, we've done projects here um, on landscape ecology of turkeys, looking at the importance of hardwoods. We've looked at tur- genetics. We've looked at uh, we radio tag uh, birds, uh, done all that. And, and now we're doing stuff looking at harvest modeling. So uh, that component's there. My agency, um, you know, before we were the Department of Wildlife, Fish and Parks, we were the uh, the Wildlife uh, Conservation Commission. And, you know, when our agency was formed in 1932, the restoration of wild turkeys was one of the very first things that the legislature, ta- the legislature tasked the agency with. So, uh, you know, almost from day one with our agency, turkeys were a central part of what we do. And I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that um, our state you know, was one of the first states to really undertake turkey restocking and restoration. Uh, not, not, not the only one, but, but we were certainly one of the early states to do that. And we had our restocking program going on, you know, uh, in the mid-1950s, and it really got underway in a, in a big way in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And um, by the mid-1980s into the early 1990s, we were largely done with turkey restocking. And if you look around the United States, you know, there was a lot of places where things were just taken off then. So we have a, a really long tradition there uh, of turkey science, of turkey management, going all the way back through restocking. And I think that uh, has enabled a really... Uh, deep, rich turkey hunting tradition that you don't necessarily see uh, everywhere. Now, now, uh, Will, you being in Alabama, I think Mississippi and Alabama both kind of share a lot of that tradition. But I mean, if you look at Mississippi, you know, people who are familiar with turkey hunting, you know, there's all kind of names that are going to come up, you know, Primos, Mossy Oak, uh, Preston Pittman, uh, Jack Dudley. I mean, all, all sorts of, you know, really prominent fixtures in kind of the greater turkey hunting industry and world, um, you know, have a Mississippi connection one way or another. So that's, uh, that's something that's really important to me. I'm really proud of. And uh, I feel like our state has always, you know, kind of been a leader in, in wild turkey research, management, hunting, all of those things mixed in together. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. I, I think, I, I mean, obviously have a pretty biased perspective, but mm-hmm. I just feel like Mississippi and Alabama are there like one and two with each other as far as, you know, the OG, if you will, <laughs> turkey states. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, like going back to kind of the, the, the ancient history of that, I mean, <clears throat> parts of Mississippi and Alabama never really lost turkeys. And I don't yeah. know, you know, there's a lot of states in the country that turkeys were completely extirpated from and the restocking that they did had to come from sources outside of their state. Uh, mm-hmm. That was never the case here. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that was not, the, Alabama was, was similar in that way. That, yeah, they, I'm pretty that sure. there were always yeah. some pockets of turkeys that remained. Uh, if you look at Mississippi, uh, the, the very Southeast part of our state, all the way up kind of the Alabama border into East central Mississippi always had turkeys, has always had a spring turkey season. You know, there was, 
There was one year during World War II where the state stopped the spring season. But outside of that, you know, we've, we've hunted turkeys in the springtime, you know, as far back as you want to look. Uh, and so, you know, again, that just goes to that tradition that we have here. And it's, it's a big deal here. Um, and I mean, it's a big deal in other places in the country. And, you know, turkey hunting is one of the few forms of hunting that's really grown a lot in recent years. So, you know, that, those traditions are taking hold in other places, but they've been here for generations. And I think, you know, Alabama is probably in that, in that same in that same place. Will's been making an ongoing joke that he's going to call me Dr. Bartram. <laughs> Uh, but even in, <laughs> in the historical writings, they, uh, with Bartram and, and some others, but there's one quote that I found from Bartram talking about his travels through the, the South. And, uh, you know, it was around that same time he was talking about the Herald of the Morning and all that. But he said that, uh, and I'm pretty sure the center of the range was Alabama and Mississippi together. Uh, in the states that he talked about being the breadbasket of turkeys. Yeah, I got one on par with that. You know, um, John James Audubon, obviously probably almost everybody's heard the name Audubon, you know, Mm -hmm. and and all his paintings. He was based out of New Orleans for much of his career in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. But he did a lot of his paintings in Mississippi. uh, And there's good reason to believe, you know, like some of the, the, that famous painting that he has of the wild turkey, you know, that was probably done from a turkey that was, taken somewhere around Natchez, Mississippi. And he's got some writings about, you know, the turkey flocks he was encountering mm-hmm. there in Mississippi. So, I mean, we are talking yeah, I've read a, lot a couple about hundred years ago with some very prominent uh, American naturalists that were talking about turkeys in my home state. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm pretty proud of, uh, of our state when it comes to wild turkey. Yeah, we got to celebrate when we get a chance because, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, we get ranked last in almost every other category. So <laughs> we'll take turkeys. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty yeah. good one to be up at the top of. There's right. probably a few listeners out there that disagree, you know, that are from a different state or whatever. I but. mean, good turkey hunting versus quality public education. <laughs> I'm going with turkey hunting. <laughs> well, yeah, it depends on what you call podcast. education, you know. I mean, I would say yeah. that a lot of my education as a youngster on the <laughs> tree listening to turkeys was pretty high quality education. Yeah, we'll just put a natural education, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think, too, uh, one thing that I think Mississippi can offer to sort of the wider turkey world uh, is, um, again, going back to the fact that we undertook and, and largely completed restocking and restoration pretty early on as compared to a lot of the, the country. Um, you know, we our population, you know, peaked or at least one of the peaks was in the 1980s. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of hand wringing right now around the country about turkey populations, particularly in some of the states where the restoration was later and where the sort of that exponential boom phase was happening in either the late 90s or the early 2000s. And and those populations may have peaked in the last 10 or 15 years. You know, we've got a little bit longer look at that where, you know, we saw some pretty high peaks in the 1980s. And from the the late 80s or say the early 90s, 90, 91, 92 to about 94, uh, we did see some very dramatic drops in harvest and things like that. And then things kind of stabilized and bounced around again. And then they they, they came back up in the early 2000s. So, um, you know, looking at the data that we have available over like that, that longer time horizon, you, you do sort of see, you see some downtimes, and, but you also see some times where things come back. And so to me, that adds a little bit of perspective. If you're in one of those states um, where you're just now coming off of that boom and, and, you know, almost anywhere it happens, it seems like after turkeys are restocked, they have about a 20 to 30 year window where they just go through the roof and they hit this peak where the numbers are just absurd. And there's just, you know, there's turkeys in every, every, stretch of woods and every field's got a big flock and and you know you hear people talking about numbers like you know I saw a flock of a hundred and that kind of thing. Almost everywhere it seems like somewhere around that 20 to 30 year mark that can't that can't sustain itself and you have some sort of a drop off. But I think the point that Mississippi may would offer to that is that that's not necessarily indicative of it's going to drop forever or that you know that it's not 
potentially going to come back. And there's mm-hmm. going to be these fluctuations that you have over time as those populations stabilize. So in other words, that after that peak, that downturn, even though it may be 20 or 30 years, is not necessarily spelling the demise of the Right. Population. We're not, we're not dealing with a, a threatened and endangered species here. Either. Right. And right. They're going to have some good times. They're going to have some bad times. And, and having, you know, in our state, that longer perspective, you, you do see some of that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and now, you know, what we really see is that, um, there's a lot of regional fluctuation within the state. There's some regions of Mississippi where I think we've got pretty stable populations. There's some regions of the state uh, where I think we do have some declining populations for mm-hmm. reasons we might want to get into. Uh, and then there's other parts of the state where, you know, there, there's probably as many birds right now as there have been in a really long time. Um, we can talk about uh, the kind of the boom and bust cycle that we experience in the, the lands along the Mississippi River. But uh, those, some of those properties right now today have as many turkeys as they've probably had in, in 20 years. Uh, so, you know, it, it's sort of all over the map when you get down to kind of the local level. Um, but that, again, is I think that's part of what happens after a population sort of peaks out and it hits this phase where it's going to fluctuate. And now you've got all these things that are interacting to, to cause these local level ups and downs and stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad you brought that up because we were just talking about this in relation to some data that Dr. Craig Harper from University of Tennessee shared with us mm-hmm. where he showed um a figure depicting turkey populations in Tennessee and it looked like the classic, you know, logistic growth curve that you see yeah. in wildlife biology 101 where you've got this really low population, restocking occurs, you get an exponential growth rate for some number of years. And then you start to see that growth rate slowly, the population is still increasing, but at a decreasing rate, then you hit a carrying capacity Mm -hmm. and you fluctuate around that. And it was making me wonder, and we were kind of speculating in the conversation about that data as to whether or not um, states that had restocked later were further along or or not as far along as the ones who had restocked earlier. And that's why, you know, as you get up into like, um, you know, as you go further to the east and to the north, that it does seem to be the case that they haven't experienced declines yet or they're experiencing declines in harvest, at least, later than other states have. And I, I think you just spoke directly to that. Yeah. And you can, you can, even, so you can see that with us at like the statewide level. If you look at our statewide harvest, you see the big exponential growth through, like I said, in our case, um, through the 70s and early 80s. And then we kind of hit this plateau and come off of it. And then we fluctuate a little bit. Um, but within our state, uh, stocking, the restocking process happened generally in a, in a South to North fashion. And I don't really exactly know why that was the case. You know, like I said, those decisions were made, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And I, I, a lot of those guys who made those decisions are not around. So I haven't heard, but but bottom line is most of the southern and central part of the state was restocked before the northern part of the state. The very mm-hmm. northern third of Mississippi uh, didn't really get restocked until um, the 80s and early 90s. And so at the local level, you can look at like harvest data from our WMAs and you see those, the, so the pattern's the same. So the pattern of that, like you're talking about that exponential growth in harvest, reported harvest from hunters, and then that stabilization and some of them, you know, come off of that. Some of them, it's pretty dramatic, come off of the off of the boom. But within our state, that's happening at different times. So like some of the WMAs we have in the very north part of the state that were the last to get restocked, the shape of that, you know, of that curve in the data, in the harvest data, is the same as in the south. It's just separated by two decades, you know. So it it for whatever reason, you know, that's that's the pattern that turkeys follow after restoration. Uh, I wish somebody could figure out why they can't sustain the high, but it, it seems to me that almost in every case, they, they're not able to sustain that initial boom and they come back to some lower level that's, you know, 15 to 30 percent lower than what the peak was. Mm-hmm. Very but it seems like that's ubiquitous across everywhere, like at the local level within Mississippi. And then if you compare, you know, our harvest trend to, you know, a state in the Midwest or, or, or a state in the far far north of new england you know it's the same trend it's just happening at different times yeah that is really interesting and def- definitely uh 
after talking to Dr. Harper and then talking to you about it, it's really interesting. It it does shape out like that carry capacity curve. I'm seeing a it, paper here. I, mean, yeah. I don't know about you, Marcus, well, but uh, looking at time from restocking and to, yeah, to no, time of peak harvest and then subsequent decline. I mean, that's really interesting. Well, the, the other thing that that may be operating and probably is operating at the same time is that carrying capacity level might change, mm-hmm. right? And you may actually, if that changes, which uh, Dr. Harper seemed to indicate in some of what he was saying with the, the increase in human populations or seeing a corresponding decline in the amount of area for a turkey to be raised in and, and live in. So, you know, we got to keep those things in mind. It, it also kind of brings in another topic that we were, were planning on uh, addressing directly with a few people uh, who are experts in the area on density dependent factors. Yeah. I think we need definitely need to go into that in more detail uh, in in some of these podcasts. But it's really yeah, interesting so that, that, to that, hear your that's perspective. That's the thing that keeps me up at night. Like uh, to me, it's, it's clear that there is some sort of density dependent mechanism that's got to be kicking in. But I don't really know what that is, and I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Yeah. But if we well, can figure, well, we can figure also, that out, it would go a long way to maybe yeah. clearing some of the confusion up, and hopefully, you know, pulling out some nuggets that can be management items to tackle you know yeah no i i'm right with you and just we, we will and i talk about this pretty commonly and we've tried to target some of these issues like the season frameworks and uh predator trapping and density dependence another one we've got lots of topics like that where we have enough uncertainty uh that that there's a lot of it, real or perceived, depending on the topic area, uh, disagreement among the professionals, you know, the experts on it. You know, you may have two or three experts on the same topic and then they're saying different things to one another. Uh, and that's one of the things we want to do in this podcast is try to take some of these issues directly on and, and give everybody their voice and let's, you know, hash out these things and, and let the, you know, the, hunting constituency that really cares about this resource understand these different perspectives and why we even have different perspectives on some mm-hmm. of these issues. Right. Yeah. But you, I think you, you do bring up a good point. Um, like talking about carrying capacity and, and, you know, you, you guys being deer guys, you know, that, 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 Means something. Oh, he called us deer guys. Guys. <laughs> on our turkey science. Po- I don't have a deer podcast. Well, so. <laughs> but you know, carry capacity as you think of it with deer, um, you know, is a fairly well accepted notion, and I think we can probably define kind of what the things are that dictate deer carrying capacity and all that sort of stuff. With turkeys, it gets a little bit more squirrely to try to pin that down exactly what what that is. I mean, we know. I think we know. We know what good turkey habitat is. We know what good brood habitat is. We know where they like to live and all those sort of things. But, you know, we don't um, we don't have a lot of good concrete examples of, you know, in, in kind of an experimental way, changing something broad scale about the habitat and then measuring how that mm-hmm. influences the birds and all that. I think that's somewhere we definitely need to go, you know, forward. I mean, we know yeah. we know how to make brood habitat, but but we we don't really know how much of it we got to have and how much of it at what point does it become limiting and all that sort of stuff you know yeah yeah well, i mean documenting demographic responses to habitat management is something that's seriously lacking in the literature yeah. across all all species really yeah well again with the quail world they're getting better at that kind of stuff they're probably out, but, out ahead of everybody uh it yeah. is interesting I, I know that i've had the conversation directly with both of you and i think we've even to some degree on the podcast and i know that i have with many other people and you probably both have as well it, it really is a, go, a hole mm-hmm. in the literature i think it's similar to the the predator trapping issue that we just recently covered and to me that's like a dream thing that we need to as researchers all get together and try to tackle at a broad scale and a lot of different circumstances but understand what that you know this role of habitat is and how the you know try to iron out some not specifics but some more general guidelines on what that looks like and how much we can expect to get out of it and how that compares to 
to other practices in isolation and also when they're paired together. Right. And the, the frustrating thing about that with, with turkeys, and, I, and really it's true with all game birds, but turkeys especially, is because they're just their populations are just by nature so erratic. They mm-hmm. are going to go up and they're going to go down. And when they go up and they go down, it can be very dramatic in a, in a real short period of time. And that is separate sort of from maybe like the long-term trends that right. you might would see in habitat, you know, over a big area that are going to dictate how good that area is for turkeys over a span of, you know, decades. Right. Um, and so separating that out from the, the sort of the little short-term, you know, yeah. up and downs that might be driven by rainfall in the springtime or whether we have a drought or not, or, you know, yeah. dif- different, different sort of, environmental factors that are going to drive that you know i think that's actually that's another good point for us to internalize just as you know communicators but also the the folks listening at home that if you're thinking about a turkey population as being a line really what it is is a super squiggly line like every year the points drop drop and bump really dramatically or maybe it's a few year period or depending on what species you're talking about but that population at that shorter time scale is pretty erratic. And then we often kind of, av- you know, draw this line through that, you know, and paint the broader picture of what the population's trending toward. But when we draw that line and then don't remember that it's super squiggly, then that, that year to year variation looks like, Oh, this is going to be a big problem when it's actually, a That's very right. normal part of the way the population, especially with turkeys. That's right. And, there, and you know, there, you know, looking around the country right now, all the concern that's out there with turkeys, you gotta, you gotta keep in mind that the, the, the crazy ups and downs are in a feature, not a bug of turkey population. And that's right. something that's been known about for a long, long time. I mean, you can go back, you know, to the 1950s with, with Wayne Bailey, one of the seminal mm-hmm. turkey biologists, you know, he, he at that time was studying populations in Virginia and West Virginia. And he was talking about even then, you know, their numbers going up or down by 50% of the long-term average from one year to the next. So, I mean, that's, that's dramatic, you know, like yeah. deer don't do that. You know, the right. deer population may be going up or it may be going down, but it's going to do that relatively slowly over a long period yeah. of time. Whereas with turkeys, you know, you may get, um, you know, a bad roll of the dice on the hatch and all of a sudden you're down 50% of what you were last year. Yeah. And to a hunter, that's huge. You know, like if, oh, yeah. if, if you're managing a piece of property and, and one year you go out there and you've got 50% fewer turkeys, I mean, it's understandable that you're going to freak out. You know, it's understandable well, that you're going to think the sky is falling. But in fact, that's just sort of part of yeah what they do. Well, even in a rising population, this is something else I'd like to go and look at those data because I haven't paid attention to it very well. But even in these populations, when they're rising rapidly, like Craig showed us with the Tennessee population, I know you have data I've seen at at some point like this as well in Mississippi, the population is still swinging from year to year or Mm -hmm. uh, over, you know, cycling yeah. Where you have up and down years. And if you look at it. And over it's a, not only just driven by population size, yeah. but we see the spike in 2020 due to people having more time to right, turkey right. hunt. Yeah, so yeah. there's yeah, there's all other, sorts and yeah. sources right. of noise. Yeah, that's that's right. the other thing that's but going even, on too. Like, especially at the state agency level, you know, we don't, we don't have perfect data. All the data right. that we have has, you know, some sort of bias associated with it. That doesn't yeah. mean it's bad data. You just got to recognize it's, right. it's going to have There's, its own issues and you got to yeah. take all of it into context. Yeah. And we, we can't measure anything perfectly either. Uh, so all, all that to say, what it, the point I was trying to make is even when the population was rapidly expanding and turkeys were hunky dory, you still have up and down years during that. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's one thing to keep in, in context, but the other part is we could take a 10 year chunk of that like you said and it would be perfectly reasonable for a population that's doing just fine to have a 50 percent difference in the the best year versus the worst year right is yeah that, that's right that's so right. even though it's doing perfectly <clears throat> fine but but the you know the flip side of that is and um it's the same with any game bird they have a really high reproductive potential. So when they get a good year and the stars align, you can go from not very many 
turkeys to a lot of turkeys in a really short window of time. But I like when um, that happens. And, you know, and that's what we, you know, keep your fingers crossed and, and we wish we could control whatever drives that. I will, I will tell you guys, you know, we're sitting here recording this uh, at the tail end of last quarter of 2020. We're coming off here as measured by our brood survey, one of the best hatches we've ever had. And, you know, we've, We've been recording brood. We've been doing our brood survey here uh, since the mid '90s, and, mm -hmm. and this hatch this year is going to go down as you know one of the top one or two or three that we've ever had. So, oh wow, that's 20, 2022 is the year of the turkey <laughs> hatch. You know, uh, in all seriousness, this year, everywhere I have talked to people and asked about it, uh, I'm hearing that you know, across several states is everybody's like, man, I got them this year. And, yeah. it, and the state folks are, are doing that. That's really great. I'm, you know, it makes me feel good. You know what that, that tells yeah. me? That we're going to have some good Turkey hunting in a couple of years. I was going to say, I need to get a Mississippi <laughs> hunt license in 2024. Yeah. Well, and to like, and you know, you guys are probably more, more knowledgeable about population biology than I am. But you know, if you get, when you get one of these big boom hatches and they're not, Numbers just explode. From that point forward, for a little while, you know the 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 per capita rate of reproduction doesn't have to be as high. All of a sudden, you can go back to just having kind of an average hatch. But because you've got so many more birds mm -hmm. on the landscape, they're going to maintain yeah. a little bit higher. And then, you know, you go three, four, five years down the road, and you get you know a really bad stroke of luck, and you get that fifty percent decline, and now you're yeah. you're back down there. So well, even just, at, even you know, in they're Mississippi, frustrated. it's a lot of. It, it's a lot of ups and downs and, and, and a lot of stuff that's hard yeah. to understand or, you know, scratch your head about. So, so given it, that that's the case, Adam, would you say that, um, you know, some of the concern that people have about pulp per hen ratios now compared to historically, um, I'm not going to say it's not justified, but maybe it's not as doom and gloom as they, as they might, as it might be, because yes, there's fewer pulps per hen, but there's more hens than there were, you know, based on the decades ago population that they're comparing to. So you don't need as many pults out there to produce the same amount, pults per hen out there to produce the same amount of overall turkeys. Right. Yeah. And that, go, that goes back to that whole density dependent thing, right? Like yeah. At, at a high density, you don't have to have as much reproduction to get the same number of mm -hmm. warm bodies on the landscape from year to year. I mean, I think that's a, a really good point to make. A lot of, uh, at least from, you know, from the, the biologists, a lot of the concern you see is because some of these states and, and you know, like I said, I, we've had a brood survey going on uh, since the mid 90s. There's some states like like Missouri, for instance, you know, they've, they've been recording mm -hmm. pulper hen ratio since the 60s. And there's some other states that have had it that long. And so when you look at those sort of places and, you know, back during that exponential growth phase, when they're coming off restocking, you do see these, you know, three, four pulp per hen numbers that they're producing. And then that number's steadily declining. Uh, we've never had, going, going back to the mid nineties, we, Mississippi's never had pulp per hen ratios on par with, with some of that. Now, had we had data from the sixties to today, maybe we would have seen some of those, you know, three, four, five pulp per hen ratios, but because our, we started the brood survey a little bit later, and like I said earlier, we were already done with restocking and um, our population had essentially already peaked by the time we started recording uh, brood data and pulp per hen ratios. We never had some of those just drastically high uh, numbers that you see in some states. The big question, I think, is like at what at what level does that pulp per hen ratio have to be to at a stable population? Like what would you expect it to be? I think the, the conventional wisdom has generally been. Uh, that it needs to be around two. I tend to think we can probably get by with a little lower than that. I think maybe a, a 1.6, 1.8 is probably what you would have at a stable population. Um, we're working with uh, Dr. Dana Morin and Mark McConnell at MSU right now uh, doing some, some work modeling some population stuff. And that's kind of one of the things we're wanting to try to get at is, it, is exactly what pole per ratio do you have to have Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that very much will frame the conversation, I think. You know, yeah. to me, it, it may be unreasonable to expect that those numbers that some of those states that have, you know, 50-year data trends on that, that what they were getting when those populations were going through the boom 
is what you should expect to have when they're at stability, you know? Well, uh, yeah, we're, we're very much looking forward to trying to get a hold of both of those folks to get them on the show. Cause Absolutely, we know they're very yeah. capable and, and, uh, one of them I know is really keen on talking about density dependence. So I, I definitely yeah. think we should, uh, try to talk about that too. But, uh, that, so what, what, what did you say that you were thinking was the, the I, I, stable? I think, well, in Mississippi's case, and I'll tell you why I think that in Mississippi's case, we, we have, um, I think pretty good monitoring data on turkey populations that we're getting from multiple sources. Mm -hmm. So we've got the brood survey and I think many listeners are probably familiar with that. That's where we get poultry hen ratios. We're recording them in the summertime. And uh, you know, it, again, it's not a perfect data set. It's got its own biases and those sort of things. The other source of data that I I put a lot of weight on in monitoring turkeys here, we call it spring gobbler hunting survey. It's, it's, some states call it avid hunter survey, mm-hmm. uh, and we've been doing that over the same time period we've been doing brood survey. So every year we send out a survey to about 1,500 turkey hunters statewide, and when they go out in the woods in the spring, they record how many turkeys they're seeing, how many turkeys they're hearing, that kind of data. And so in a given year, that usually will account for um, about 20,000 trips afield from all over the state. And and since we began um, that monitoring survey, you know, we've got over half a million records now, you know, trips afield. And so usually with, with us, those two things corroborate one another really well. Like if the brood survey number goes up, usually the next year, the observations that the turkey hunters see will also go up and you can, you know, they, they align really well, you know, if you do like a regression or something on mm-hmm. And normally if that, if that poult per hen ratio here gets up in the ballpark of about 1.8 ish, you're going to see a bump in turkey in observations from the turkey hunters in the following year. And you'll usually see a bump in harvest rate two years later when those birds become adult gobblers. So two years. Um, that's why I think here, you know, I don't know, even though two has always kind of been two pulse per hen has always kind of been the conventional wisdom. I think just looking at what we've got, I, I think you can get by with a little bit lower than that. Now, one thing to keep in mind, like, Game birds in general, like if you look at the southeast versus the north, um, you know, there's probably going to be some differences. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's, you know, and, and it's not been well demonstrated with turkeys, but with some other game birds, you know, uh, the demographics that maintain a population in the south may not be the exact same demographics that maintain a population in the north. So just oh, because yeah, you know, we, that one point eight may work here, that may not mean that that's what, you know, Pennsylvania or New York needs to have. Yeah. 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 That's a really good point. Similar to some of the discussion we had with the predator uh, episode. Yeah. My, I mean, my immediate assumption or thought on that, and it's something I've never even heard, heard mentioned before today, but um, my immediate reaction is to go to buffering against more overwinter mortality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And like, I think the, I think the quail world has demonstrated that pretty well that the, you know, when you, when you go North, you generally have higher overwinter survival. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, higher overwinter mortality and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so you've got to have higher reproduction to maintain that. Whereas, you know, here in the, in the deep South, that may not necessarily be the case. So all that in the discussion of pulp per hen just sort of means that it, you know, the, the pulp per hen ratio that may be what maintains a population over the long term might be different in the deep South than it is in the upper Midwest or something. Mm-hmm totally possible that's yeah hey, you, you guys are researchers that's something we need to figure out y'all, y'all yeah. get to work on that i'm over here just taking notes <laughs> on all the project ideas i've already gotten yeah. in this you know first 20 minutes of conversation yeah no it's good stuff well uh i i completely forgot why i asked you what the you thought the sustainable thing was because you went on a, a different uh path than i was thinking of but it was really good stuff uh, so, well, I remember now. So you've got these hunters that are sending in surveys for the pulp, mm-hmm. the pulp data, pulp hen. And do you have that same data on the WMAs, or are they mixed together? Can you act, like? Do you know what the private versus public pulp um, hen looks like? Yeah. So our our brood survey that we do in the summertime, you know that. 
uh, that goes out to like everybody working for our agency. So that would be all of our biologists, WMA staff, um, conservation officers, those sorts. Um, we send it out to the Forest Service. We send it out okay. to um, private timber companies. Um, and in recent years, we've sent it. We've also sent it out to sort of private citizens. That was not the way it was historically done, but to try right. to bump up sample size, we've been doing that for about five years or so. Mm-hmm. So we are getting data from WMAs, and like it's it's um, denoted in there. We know that it, you know this came this observation yeah. came from a WMA. Um, usually, the brood data is not like the sample size at the WMA scale is usually not enough to say something one way or another about the individual WMA. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are getting all those observations from public and private land. Yeah. Do you have a feel on how they compare to one another? That's something that I get asked about and I hear about a lot. Usually that there, um, there's not major, there's not huge differences in the two. Um, okay. So you're not just seeing like a glaring difference in productivity. No, not, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. Um, okay. when I've looked at it in the past, it was, it, it was not like a dramatic difference between yeah. the two. While we're on the topic of public versus private, you know, one of the things that you and I have been talking about is differences in harvest rates between the two. And I know you had mentioned that to Adam uh, previously that was maybe something we want to talk about today. Do you want to go into that now or? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's really up to, to you, Adam, what you want to, what, where you want to go with it. I mean, we, we really want to talk about, uh, some of the work that you guys have been doing and uh, there, there's a broader question I think that that is, is, is of interest to a lot of people and that that was one of the reasons I was curious about that that productivity data is similar to what you're saying will what what does the harvest look like and and I think you have some uh, from Mississippi some good data kind of looking at the differences and what harvest looks like. And I think it's probably relevant uh, to the conversation to know how, how, or what does it look like generally on WMAs versus private lands in terms of the, the harvest pressure? Yeah. Um, I mean, so obviously there's a lot more hunting pressure on public lands than private lands. Not, and not all private. I mean, some, some, you know, again, going back to Mississippi being a, a uh, big time turkey hunting state. You know, I, I, I say all the time, there's not a turkey in the state of Mississippi that gobbles that isn't getting chased by somebody. You know, <laughs> so um, there's a lot of hunting pressure almost no matter where you go. Uh, but obviously, there's more on public lands that are open access where people can go day after day after day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what what we see here, like uh, on average across the state, if you want to take um, take some of our harvest data and and sort of uh, back calculate it we average about uh one turkey harvested per 1200 ish uh acres across the state and usually that's going to be higher than that on a wma is you know, that WMA. is that based on total land area or just quote unquote huntable or so basically suitable? that's that's uh outside of the delta so if you're people who aren't familiar with mississippi the area that we call the the delta which is the uh, mississippi alluvial valley you know the floodplain in mississippi river it's very different than the rest of the state and it's largely row crop ag dominated, very few woods. The few woods that are there are usually going to be around um, swamps or cypress breaks or something like that. So it's largely void of turkeys. Um, now there's a couple of places in there uh, like Delta national forest and big tracts of bottomland hardwood that have birds. And then the area right along the margin of the Mississippi river between the Mississippi river and the Mississippi River levee system has some of the highest populations of turkeys we have. But, but the majority of what we call the Delta doesn't have a lot of birds. So when I say a, a turkey per 1,200 acres or so is what we average, that's outside of the Delta, basically in what, what is, you know, turkey range within our state. Um, so on WMAs, it's going to be a little bit higher than that, you know, depending on the WMA, um, most of them are going to average a bird per um, six, 700 acres, something like that. And then like on, we go back to that, um, spring goblin hunter survey stuff. So we have some of that information that's tied to individual hunting clubs and we know that their information is coming from that. So like the really high end hunting clubs, you know, the top tier, best Turkey habitat, best parts of the state do really well. You know, they may take a bird per, uh, 250 acres or something. 
Um, oh, wow. And, and so, so it, it, you know, it runs the gamut, but again, it all, it all comes back to sort of habitat quality at the local level. And, you know, Marcus, like we talked about, even if we're talking about public land, um, there's a big gradient in between habitat quality on public land. Some, some of our public lands have very good turkey habitat mm-hmm. and very stable harvest. Some of them, you know, maybe lack some features that, that you would like to see to, to be the best. Uh, and so you, you got a big gradient there. Yeah, that, I think that's important to keep in mind is that we have this, it's not just like one of them's better than the other or, or they're, you know, either group is similar. There's a wide variation in quality and productivity for turkeys even you may even be in a small geographic region but it's still a wide variability in productivity that's uh consistently variable i guess on the private and public land but you said something else that that uh got me my mind erasing a little bit uh are you were you saying or or can you say whether or not the harvest level is that reflecting the quality of habitat and productivity? Like it sounded like a, uh, what do you mean? You were seeing a higher harvest rate on places that tend to have a higher productivity uh, from the habitat stuff. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I think I understand. So like the, when I'm talking about like the spring gobbler hunting survey data that's coming from hunters, like the own private hunting clubs that are, you know, well managed and, doing everything right and all of that. Uh, yeah, you do see they, they tend to have, you know, more gobblers harvested per unit of area than, than sort of the average, like the average mm-hmm. across that group is about a bird per 500, but the high end clubs are going to be yeah. a lot more than that. Um, so that's then, not just you know, because they're, you, you don't yeah. think that's just because it's a collection of people that are just way better at turkey hunting. Well, there, yeah, there is that too, you know, so there's a, <laughs> you kind of tease all of that out. Um, so I, like, I guess I just threw out a couple of different numbers that were coming from different sources. Like when yeah. I say like on average across the state, uh, we average about a bird per 1200 acres or so that's like scattered all across the state. Like if you yeah, took yeah, our yeah. statewide harvest and then you just applied that to acres that are turkey habitat, you know, that's the average across right. the state. Well, yeah, you look at, I, I wasn't meaning to uh, call into question anything. I realize you're having to paint with a broad brush. I was more trying to tease out, and then I was joking about the, the hunting thing because, like, I'm not going to harvest that many birds per, <laughs> per area with my level of skill, but there are probably other people that could uh, just because of differences in skill. But uh, I was more just thinking, you know, when you're, you're given, you're having to paint with a broad brush. Yeah, uh, yeah, it sounded like the folks that are really putting a lot of effort into creating a high productivity thing or reaping some benefits from that, uh, for, based on the, yeah. the data that you're. Collecting. I think that's right. I, I mean, you, you know, you there's there's a lot we don't know about turkeys, but you know, there certain properties definitely produce more turkeys year after year. And I mean, mm-hmm. there's, there's reasons why that happens. And they're sustaining higher harvest even is right. I think where I ultimately wanted to get to is on those properties that are consistently producing more. They do have a five, you know, five, five or six times as many gobblers per area based on what you right. were saying that they are sustaining over a long term. They're harvesting five or six times as many birds and still, have a lot of birds which right, is right you know, and they're, you know and they're still just like we were talking about before they're still going to have these year-to-year variations sure they're still sure. up and down and all that um but if you if you look at it from that way you know the, the the people who care a lot about turkeys and are doing a lot of the right things and are in the right landscape i think that's yeah. something that gets overlooked too with yeah. turkey management is that your ability to have a lot of turkeys is going to be dictated by a pretty big land mass around you like yeah. what your neighbors are doing down the road yeah, definitely we, influences we talked your about ability that. to have success uh, but all of those yeah. things if, if you've got everything going right in a pretty big area and then you're doing the right things on your property you know definitely it, it pays dividends yeah that's that's really good information uh, we talked about that uh in similar context where most people in terms of for turkeys especially but most people don't control enough land you know to really have all the influence on the population be from their own effort 
you know, it's right. usually a collective effort between many landowners. Well, that, yeah, I mean, and that's really interesting. It's not exactly what I would have, I would have expected. I would, I mean, it makes sense that you'd have a greater harvest density on well-managed private lands because it's capable of supporting that. Right. But on the other side of the equation, you could see having a, a greater harvest density on public lands just because they receive so much more pressure. Mm -hmm. But harvest density is a function of a lot of things, including right. bird numbers, pressure, and all sorts of different, you know, other right. lesser factors as well. But kind of, I guess one of the reasons we wanted to steer the conversation this way is because, you know, when thinking about season dates and the effect of spring harvest of males on turkey productivity, we know that, I mean, if you kill... 90% of your males the last week of March, you're probably going to have pretty poor reproduction, right? Or even 95%, like just as an extreme example. Um, but as you back off of that, the question is like, where does, where, where do you reach the tipping point where you still have enough males available just, you know, just for the copulation mm -hmm. events. Right. And a lot of data, on in these turkey research projects because they're state agency funded the state agencies want them those projects to be conducted on wildlife management areas public land because they have more control of those mm -hmm. areas even to you know implement some kind of manipulation um, like we saw in the tennessee study that we recently talked yeah. about with dr harper um, but this all is kind of i guess the point i'm trying to make what i'm building up towards is you know if harvest rates are much more have a much higher intensity on these public lands that could be shaping the way that we see harvest intensity affecting reproduction versus if it's lower elsewhere, um, it may not be at that threshold that, that would affect reproduction. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in other words, you may not see the same pattern that we observe in yes. these studies because they're on sure. public land compared to private land because of the differences in that context. Right. And if you, if you look at, um, the turkey literature and the research that's just that's been done, and, and you know, there's a lot of it. It's overrepresented on public land. I mean, right. I, I don't know what the percentage would be, but the the vast majority of turkey research that has been done in the United States has been done on public land. And you you guys are researchers. You you probably under, understand why, but it, largely because public lands are uh, you're typically you're dealing with a larger property holding that you only got to deal with one property ownership. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to coordinate with a whole bunch of different landowners to get on the place. Um, it's, it's something that's going to remain in the same ownership type for a long period of time. You know, if, if, if you guys, uh, you know, got funding to do a hundred thousand dollar Turkey research project and put a bunch of birds on a piece of private property and all, all of a sudden that private property sold and the new landowner didn't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a problem for research. So there's a reason why uh, most of the past work has been done on public land. But it's, it, the point is to be made that that's where a lot of the information does come from. We don't know what private landowners are doing on their land. And they, you know, they may not want the, the state or, or the university to be on their land interrupting turkey season or whatever. So that, that problem gets magnified when you go to private land because the landowner is usually the one that gives you permission is usually a smaller landowner uh, in terms of their contiguous acres they have uh, control over compared to the state or federal land. And then you just magnify that problem where you have a bunch of competing interests that you're going to have to deal with uh, when you're trying to, to do the study. So I certainly have seen that and heard it from many researchers uh, trying to do this right. kind of work where it's we, we can we get – you know, it, I think it's pretty easy to understand, I guess, why we would focus a lot of effort on public land. But there's also, a, I think, a reasonable uh, concern of how well that applies to both landscapes. Sure. Yeah. And sure. I don't think we need to dismiss that research because it was done on public land. We just need to be we just need to make sure yeah. that we discuss it in the proper context. Yeah, it's just like what you were saying earlier, Adam, that every data set, every experiment, is, they always have weaknesses yeah, because we can't do everything. Right. If we were going to do this in an ideal world, we'd have every turkey marked and know what happened exactly. You know, but we, uh, that's just not feasible. 
So right. uh, we know there's weaknesses and we need to be cognizant and acknowledge those weaknesses and try to deal with them right. as best we can. You know, but I mean, you know, Will, you, you brought a good point. I mean, I know there's a, there's a lot of discussion about season frameworks and how they affect turkeys and things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I address the elephant in the room here. You know, I'm sitting in Mississippi who, uh, you know, we have the longest season in the country and we're one of the earliest openings in the country. I think the south zone of Florida opens earlier than us. And we used to open concurrent with Alabama, but there's been slight shifts there. Um, so, you know, the, the issue of harvest and harvest frameworks is something that's important to us. Um, and it's something we've recognized for a while. Um, we, uh, about 10 years ago, really started down the road of trying to develop a strategic plan for turkeys and what we wanted to address and all that. And, and we went through a, a, a lot of stuff to try to get to that. If folks want to see it, it's on, on our website. You can see our Mississippi Comprehensive Wild Turkey Management Plan. But, you know, it, it lays out in there that we need to look at spring season stuff and um, try to understand the effect of our spring season, given that it's so liberal and, and there's concerns out there about turkey populations and all that. And so, uh, we've we've really been checking a lot of the boxes that that plan laid out to to sort of evaluate our spring spring framework. Now, one of the first things that happened uh, when that plan was developed and adopted, we did not have a harvest reporting system here. In other words, uh, and this is this probably sounds crazy to to some folks in other parts of the country, but you know, hunter could when he hunter shot a turkey, he'd take the turkey home, and that was the end of it. You know, and um, since then, in 2019, we implemented a game check system where hunters are mandatory, mandatorily required to report their harvest. And that was important in this bigger picture because that, that then was able to give us information about the breakdown of harvest within the season, better information about you know, who's killing one bird, two birds, three birds, those sort of things. And it was one of the first steps in us trying to you know, evaluate our spring season framework. Um, the other thing we did, we, we decided, you know, before we go down the road of trying to implement anything at a statewide level, let's test some things at a more local level. And so in 2019, we embarked upon um, kind of a, an experiment where we changed some frameworks on some WMAs. And we took a subset of our WMAs and we shifted the season back several weeks. And then each of those had a paired control WMA that was, you know, kind of like kind nearby. Uh, same size, same habitat, you know, everything that would make you think those two areas should be kind of analogous to one another. And uh, that, so just that control, control. I'm sorry, just before you go. So you were tracking some data on those before you implemented those changes? Or? Yeah. So okay. hunters on our WMAs are recording the same sort of observational data that I was referencing with the, like the, the mm -hmm. avid hunter survey earlier. So, okay. You know, they're telling us how many turkeys they're seeing and how many turkeys they're hearing, how many jakes they're coming across, how many they're harvesting and all of that. And we got that data set going way back. And so um, you can compare the, the two. You can compare the, the areas where we changed the season on and you can compare um, the areas that stayed with the season framework. And uh, you know, I don't know what we expected at the onset of that. And we're, we're kind of on the very back end of wrapping up some of the analysis of some of that, see what has happened. But, but bottom line, there does not seem to be dramatic changes between those two areas uh, in terms of things like the, the number of turkeys people are encountering on those areas, the number of uh, harvest per unit of effort, that sort of stuff. Um, even Jake observations, which we hope to use as sort of like a metric of recruitment. If we move the season mm -hmm. back, did it increase reproduction on those areas and recruitment? Um, you know, that's not different between the control and treatment. So, um, you know, we've, our approach to, to trying to evaluate the season has been, you know, we want to be sure if, if whatever we do, we want it to be data driven. And mm -hmm. we, we don't want to make changes that are going to take opportunity away from hunters in the woods if we can't demonstrate some sort of rate of return, you know, that they're going to get out of that. And I, you know, um, in addition to that, we, we've been, working with MSU on some heart on some modeling, some harvest models that, mm -hmm. that you know, basically like, like the, the, uh, the, the easy way to, to describe that is basically allow us to play what if games where we put all of this data into this model and then say, okay, what if we, uh, you know, reduce the bag limit? What if we reduce the length of the season? What if we did this? And then, you know, see what the projections are. 
And, and again, even with that, we don't see that things about the spring season are, are making dramatic differences in what we expect the number of birds on the landscape to be down the road. So, um, you know, that's, that's been our process. And, and I know, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of actions in a lot of places in recent years uh, with spring hunting frameworks and, and people being, you know, concerned about turkey populations and, and you know, potentially rightfully so. Um, but, you know, our approach here ha has been that, you know, we have this long tradition of very liberal season frameworks, um, and that goes back decades and decades. We've got opinion survey data here from hunters that show that, you know, they like the status quo. Um, surprisingly, even though uh, we have the, the longest season in the country, the, we did an opinion survey just a few years ago, and we had more hunters, even though we're already the longest season in the country that opens one of the earliest openings in the country, we had more respondents in our opinion survey who thought our season should be longer than it currently <laughs> is than who thought it should be shorter than it currently is. Well, we had more respondents who thought that our season should open earlier than it currently does than later. Uh, and so, you know, coming from our place as a state agency who's managing this public trust resource for the hunters, when you see information like that, that, hey, they, they like the long liberal opportunity, they like the, the season that starts pretty early in the breeding season. Um, there was on, in that survey, one of the things we asked uh, for the people who said that they think the season should open later, we asked them, like, if they responded that way, we asked them uh, uh, a series of options of dates that they think that, it, okay, you want it later, what date would you like it to be? And, and basically each date was backed up by a week mm. off of what our current framework is. There was not a single respondent. The response rate was zero of people who wanted to shift it all the way back to like when peak nest incubation would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're so in Mississippi's case, you know, we're coming from this place where we're, we've had a long tradition of very liberal opportunity, very long opportunity. We're coming from a place where the hunting public, as they've described to us, does not want um, massive changes to the framework, and so that led. Us to believe, okay, if we're going to go down this road of evaluating season, you know, we really got to dot our I's and cross our T's before we do something. And, you know, we don't want to take our opportunity away if we can't demonstrate that it's going to have a return that hunters are going to appreciate. And so those, you know, that WMA experimental stuff that I, I talked about and then the harvest modeling stuff, that's been our, our way of, of, of kind of moving forward. Uh, to evaluate that sort of thing. And, and again, neither of those are showing us, at least at this moment, that there's a whole lot of promise there and that that being the things that are going to drive the number of turkeys. So, so is that for the number of turkeys on the landscape or anything like that? So with your manipulation on the WMAs, you, you're four years post now? Is exactly. That, yes, 2022 20, was the fourth year into that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's a little bit longer than the Tennessee study has been, but... Uh, again, we know, and I think we should just put it out there. There's always strengths and weaknesses, right? But the, you know, some of the strengths of this is the design. Mm -hmm. it, you know that you have a that before after control impact, and that's a beautiful thing in a long term data set. Some of the weaknesses, as we've all discussed, is you don't have direct measurements of that's right. reproductive parameters, but you do have some good indices like the the jake recruitment for instance that are a little bit later down the road but they're a pretty good indicator of how many birds are getting or successful and and probably a better indicator even if some of the other metrics we use of how many are getting recruited into the gobbling uh, right the but on gobbling the flip, population on the flip side of that the strength of that data type is that hunter observations of birds, sighting birds, hearing birds is like, I mean, that's your goal, right? To mm -hmm. increase that. Yeah. I mean, that's the it's, metric we're ultimately interested in. Right. More sightings, you know, more gobbles, more harvest. Mm -hmm. But right. so far they and haven't that, documented increases in those. Yeah. And the, and the important thing to note about that, I mean, you could, so it, you know, we're, we're um, evaluating that 
through hunter observational data. And you could poke holes in that. There's mm-hmm. biases with it, but those biases are going to be consistent across the controls and sure. the treatment. So the yeah. areas that got moved back yeah. and the areas that stayed the same have the exact same bias. Right. You know? And that's one of the beautiful strengths of that type of design is that you have problems, but you've standardized those problems so that you can, you know, more, more right. uh, accurately measure responses to a treatment. And that, I think that's a really important thing. Another thing I wanted to point out is yours is on public land. And a lot of the stuff I think that Dr. Harper was talking about was on private land. As far as I remember, I know some of it was on public land. Some is on private, I think. Yeah. I can't remember the breakdown, uh, but anyway, yeah. uh, and I, I think it's really cool, you know, because that, that I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with what they're doing in Tennessee, you know, and the two, I think will complement one another, yeah. even though they're, um, very kind of very similar in in the treatments that got done you know moving the season back and all that yeah. but they're very different in the type of data they're collecting right and so that's know, what yeah that's I where i was that's getting a good to compliment to one another yeah so now we have what i was going to get into is a, the context is very different and we i'm not sure about the public private part of it but uh the data that it, they are collecting versus the data that you're collecting are very different kinds of data but very similar strengths in the experimental design. And I guess it sounds like they're fairly consistent in terms of what, you know, you've seen so far. And I know, I know, uh, they, and, and yours is still preliminary. You haven't finished everything. And we, uh, want to talk to Dr. Morin and, and, uh, Dr. McConnell about it further, uh, when that's, you know, more complete and been through peer review and all those sorts of things. Uh, as well but it is a you know interesting to mm-hmm. kind of for us to look at it early where these are some of the earliest data sets looking at in a controlled way uh shift in the seasons and and you haven't seen that much demographically from the birds it sounds like yeah yeah adam i, I, had, I think go ahead i'm sorry to interrupt you i just i had a couple uh, one more question about the uh the study design how long was the delay on those areas and how closely did that coincide with um, average initiation dates of, of laying? So that's a, that's a good question. So um, those WMAs got moved back to April the 1st. Okay. Which, you know, we've got a lot of historic telemetry data here in Mississippi. So that's still, um, that's still before the bulk of the hens are nesting. You know, we know from research here that most hens are not nesting until mid April, you know, April mm-hmm. 15th, 20th, somewhere around there. And, you know, basically the dates are pretty similar no matter where you're at in Southeast, mm-hmm. that, that kind of April 15th to 20th to 25th, somewhere in there. Um, so you, you could argue that, you know, we weren't directly testing um, the hypothesis about early season harvest, but, you know, you got to also keep in mind um, some of the opinion data that I mentioned earlier. We, we already knew that the hunter's, um, from the opinion survey stuff we got seemed to have no interest in going all the way back to what the, the nesting date would have been. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we felt like, well, we, we need to shift it back. What can we, what can we shift it to? That's a reasonable, um, a, a reasonable alternative that might would be able to make its way into policy at the statewide level. And let's test that at a small scale. Mm-hmm. You know? And so that's why we ended up there. Gotcha. Yeah, what- it also is interesting, and I I think it's great insight into you know the state agency that you're really you know you're trying to serve the people and the resource at the same time, and you need to put together things that that are going to be popular, not, well not necessarily popular, but at least not completely one hundred percent unpopular, unless. Right. You know, like you're you're saying, there's zero percent of people who want to move the season back that far. But if it's warranted, you need to know really well biologically it's warranted before you can defend that position. Right, uh, and that that was like our whole um, that was our our, our whole thought process. It was we, you know, when we started down the road, honestly, we we expected we were going to see positive results. That we we did not start where we've ended up in terms of our thinking we thought Mm -hmm. we'll do this it will show some positive results and that will you know frame a a bigger conversation Uh, yeah so basically like 
if we need a if we need to move the dates biologically, we're going to demonstrate that because we know it's not going to be popular. So we, right. we yeah, I look at it as, data. I look at it as give the hunters what they want as long as it's biologically defensible. Right. You yeah, they they all they don't want the turkey population to decline to the point they can't hunt them either. Right. So, you know, that's a right. little bit longer term perspective, but that's what you're trying to make sure, okay, biologically is this something that's needed so that we can have a sustainable resource because ultimately the hunters would rather have that and start a couple weeks later yeah than not be able to take their grandkids because there aren't turkeys anymore absolutely right right and i get it i mean and we hear that a lot you know that we got to do something or you know you know we need to reduce the season because the turkeys are declining all these other things I, i hear that and i what I hear people say when 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 I hear that is they're worried about the future of the turkey population, mm-hmm. and we all should be. If we're Absolutely. if we're serious about being conservationists and hunters, we all should be worried uh, about where turkeys are going to go in the future. I mean, there's you know there, there's not a single game bird east of the Rocky Mountains that is not declining in some or part of its range, you know. Um, and so there's a, Wait, a lot of legitimate reason to be concerned, uh, but. You know, our our take was people in Mississippi are pretty serious about turkey hunting. And we have this really long tradition of being very liberal and providing a lot of of, of opportunity. And we're a very conservative state politically. And that means, you know, we usually want people to make decisions at the most local level possible. And in, in a place that's 90 percent private land, that's going to be, you know, at the landowner level. So mm-hmm. our agency has traditionally taken that view and and. Um, you know, not just with turkeys, but with, with all game species, kind of taking that view of it, we're 90% private land, very conservative state. Let's allow maximum flexibility to the landowner to make decisions as they see fit. And so, you know, if that's where you're starting from, and if you think where you need to go may be a reduction of that, you better come with some pretty strong data to justify it. Mm-hmm. And that's that's kind of where we were, and that's why we started uh started the, the case study in the way we did so that, you know, we could either provide some information to support making some shifts or say, Hey, it, it didn't really work here. So we're skeptical about uh, pushing it to a bigger scale. Yeah. Well, one I thing s- I do, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to lead up and maybe what you were going to, cause I know we've talked about this before, but I was just thinking, okay, well, you know, there's there's a lot of different reasons why you might want to move the season, and and yeah. uh, one one of them is biological in nature that we're trying to make sure that we're not impacting turkeys negatively, but from the biological standpoint. But are, are there other reasons that you might yeah. want to move it? Yeah, sure, and that I'm I'm glad you brought that up. That was where I was wanting to go. So one thing that's interesting to, to come out of this. Uh, looking at those WMAs, and again, this I'm 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 telling you all this. We're we're recording this in the fall. I don't know when this will come out, but you know the the final data analysis and polishing is not totally done yet. So I'm, I'm I may be speaking a little out of turn right now. But um, what you do see in the WMAs that were moved back is that hunters hear a little bit more gobbling. They're not it, but they're not seeing more turkeys. They're not harvesting more turkeys. They're not seeing more jay coming back but you do hear a little bit more gobbling activity per time spent in the woods. And so the, the thought there is it's not because there were more turkeys in the woods It's because we're starting the season right at the time when gobbling is peaking. So Mississippi, we got, we got really good gobbling data. I've I've mentioned several times uh, in the last hour or so about our spring gobbler hunting survey data. So we got, you know, half a million trips of field where people are recording their goblins. So we know really, really well within the season when goblin peaks. And then we did a project about 10 years ago where we looked at, uh, we did gobbling surveys uh, outside of the season from mid-February all the way to the 1st of June. So we know what goblin is doing outside of that. And in our state, you, you do see a pretty big gradient in, I say big, not that big, you, you see a difference between the south part of the state and north part of the state in terms of gobbling activity. The southern mm-hmm. part of the state, uh, gobbling activity is going to ramp up really fast, and it's going to peak somewhere in the last week or so of March. 
the northern part of the state, it's a little bit later than that. It's usually April 1st or maybe April, you know, the first week of April sometime. So if you move the season back so that it's it's starting and basically coinciding with when gobbling is peaking, that turkey that might would have woken up on March the 15th and gobbled six times and then got shot, he's going to wake up and gobble 40 times before he gets shot on April the 1st. And so, you know, if you look at that type of data, that type of observational data, like I'm talking about, like at a per, you know, per time spent in the woods, you hear a little bit more gobbling. It's not because there's more turkeys. It's just because they're gobbling more. You're holding off, you're holding off reducing the number of birds till right at peak gobbling. So you're going to hear a little bit more. And so that's, that's one of those things that, you know, we do have to take into consideration because like you say, I mean, there's, there's these biological things. How does hunting affect the population biologically? Is harvest sustainable? Is it affecting the number of turkeys you see over a long period of time? Is it affecting whether they're going up or down? Uh, I feel like we've kind of answered that and said, eh, it doesn't really look like the harvest framework is a key driver of that system. But when we time the season and, and, and all of that can influence, you know, how much gobbling people are hearing when they're in the woods. And so those are conversations that we're going to have to have as a staff, you know, how do you balance those two things? And, and, you know, as we're recording this here today, we, we've not kind of came to a resolution on that, but you know, that's, that's something that's important to consider is the, the hunting quality aspect of it. Yeah. What know, was those are, those are all the, the human dimension side of it and the <laughs> biological side of it kind of all will get rolled in together to, to come up with a recommendation. So it, it's possible that, you know, at the end of the day, we may, still offer some tweaks to our system or to our season. Uh, I don't know, you know, where we're going to end up landing, but, um, you know, that's, that's what I've laid out over the last 20 minutes or so has kind of been our approach where we wanted to be very, very meticulous and cautious and, uh, and really try to gather as much information as we can before we, we, we come to a conclusion. Right. What, what was the all start date this year, Adam? It's been, uh, March the 15th, uh, for, but basically since 2005, we've been at March the 15th. Prior to that, um, we were around March 18th or 20th for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm just thinking about, um, the gobbling data we collected in Alabama this year. You know, it was like those, I feel like it was like those last five to seven days of March when we really saw gobbling ramp up, um, in yeah, Alabama. But that was which, statewide, right? On your Yeah. Side. Yeah. But I mean, I, that, I think further validates Adam's point that they could be starting right now a little bit before that. I mean, it's still, there's still a lot of gobbling going on that week that they start. But if I remember correctly, we saw that saw it really peak the following week mm -hmm. here in Alabama. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and um, you know, like I said, there's, it, it differs depending on where, where you are here in our mm -hmm. state. Like the, another thing that, you know, because we open so early that very, first week of our season, a lot of times, you know, just the weather is still kind of, kind of squirrely right then, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're still getting some of those winter fronts and things like that. And usually by that last week of March, most years we've settled more into a kind of a typical spring weather kind of a pattern. And that influences goblin rates and, mm -hmm. you know, how they're acting and how hunters are experiencing it and all that too, you know? Sure. Yeah. But, I, but yeah, to Will, to your point, I mean, that's, you know, that last week or so of March, for a lot of Mississippi is going to kind of be prime time. The very northern part of the state, it's a little bit later than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing, I, I know you've talked about it before, um, but I think it's something that's important. One, that, you know, how in, I think it's important for everybody to realize how important it is to you, as uh, I'm just saying, you representing the state, how important it is to, you know, improve and maintain hunter satisfaction. Uh, as the constituents and and then that has lots of roles uh, it's not just for the sake of hunters being satisfied but also to retain hunters because they're so important in the conservation aspect uh, from you know financially and keeping that interest but uh, another thing that you said one time that resonated with me is related to youth hunting and I think that was another thing right now the the youth hunting doesn't really line up right yeah so again again you know y'all are y'all are catching me a, a, a little bit premature on some of this because we're yeah. we're right now uh trying to in ongoing conversations as a staff about where we want to go uh traditionally our youth season so we have a week-long youth season here 
And traditionally that week long youth season has overlapped with the time when most schools are out for spring break. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's, you know, that's, that season has been in place probably since around 2000, somewhere in there, late nineties, 2000s for reasons that I don't really know, most of the schools in the state, and I've actually, like, I, I spent a, a, a chunk of an afternoon looking at the calendars for each <laughs> school district in the state. Most of our schools have shifted the spring break back a week in the last two years. And so now that youth week doesn't align with the spring break week when the kids are out and, and could go hunting. And so, again, that, that's not a biological factor. That's not yeah. something to think about in terms of what turkeys are doing, but that makes a big difference in those kids' ability to get in the woods and that sort of thing. And so that's, uh, you know, that's another yeah. one of those sort of outside the biology components that you got to think about as a state agency in certain yeah. seasons and stuff. Well, I, I, yeah, and I, I know that uh, you guys are trying to deal with a lot and figure out what you're going to do. And it's, I'm not really prodding on trying to get at what you decide, but I'm trying to more bring to light. There are some really important reasons to consider what the season timing is, even if it's not biological. And, you know, while we're all sitting here, we want this resource to be sustainable in time and hunting, keep maintaining hunting interest and recruiting new hunters is from the long-term standpoint, very important for turkeys and the conservation yeah. of the species and maintaining the, the uh, traditions and cultures, you know, that it, have been built around this species and to me that's something that really resonates is when i was a kid i used to use spring break to go turkey hunting just like you're saying i grew up in west alabama and uh that was you know spring break week was when i was going to go hunting and that was an important part of me developing into who i am now and you know passionate and i think there are probably a lot of people like this that are super passionate about this species and it starts from stuff like that. You know, having that opportunity and the fact that I was out of school right then at the first week of season and was able to go with my granddaddy and sit. We had a place called the Blackfield. We'd go sit in the in his little uh, truck and we would listen because at that time he wasn't getting around extremely well already and I can remember sitting in that little Toyota, the little red Toyota with him and listening. We were kind of on a little mound in the property and you could hear the turkeys all around the property. And I can remember sitting there and it, and it just resonates with me. And that's something that I really appreciate is that we need to be thinking about how are we going to get kids the best opportunity to experience that and develop the next wave of, passionate turkey hunting conservationists uh you know that that a lot of us experienced when we were kids and i just wanted to bring that up not because i'm suggesting you should make a decision at the state level based on that but it is those kinds of things are i think are really important and, and probably not thought about enough or or valued enough it's you know? so hard yeah. too because if you don't let the if you don't let the the kids or i mean even hunters in general hunt during that during that period of time or some period of time you you restrict their season down those memories are never made mm-hmm. but also if you give them too much opportunity and access then those memories are never made for a different reason we over harvest mm-hmm. the population so i think that in and of itself yeah. kind of describes the balancing act that state agency yeah. biologists faced yeah it's de- yeah. definitely and I, really I, tricky while, you know while we have this second or that thought I, I do want to you know give kudos out to our commission because they've um you know and that works different in every state but here in mississippi you know ultimately the commission are the ones that make the decisions um they're appointed by the governor and my job as a biologist is simply to make recommendations to them but they have been very generous uh on the issue of turkey season frameworks and stuff with us and, and been very willing to uh, be patient and let the process play out uh, give us as a staff of biologists time to collect the information and gather it all and 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 really evaluate it and and I very appreciate them of that because I know you know you, you look around the country there's a lot of uh, a lot of concern and there's a lot of pressure to make um, to make adjustments to make changes you know people people hunters they they want an easy fix and uh, our commission has been willing to kind of let this process play out. So I just want to say uh, I'm very appreciative of that and that relationship. Yeah. 
Well, that's a good point. Uh, it's definitely, you know, a lot of, uh, I mean, that's why we're, why we wanted to cover it. There's a lot of, of interest and concern from, from multiple angles on this issue. And, you know, we will ultimately want to do what's biologically appropriate, but also what is, uh, going to maximize hunter satisfaction and interest and make sure that we maintain that because i mean it, i don't know that we've talked about it in enough detail or or in if people have heard it but there are a lot of examples of species that we have uh, we still have or still are abundant because we have maintained an interest in that species i'm mm. talking about globally from, yeah, a, from a hunting sure. standpoint, there are a lot of species that hunting has been a really big part of the conservation of not even just that species, but a whole community of species that might be associated with the same type of land or, or uh, land use or whatever. Uh, there are lots of examples. And, uh, yeah. I and, think and it's like, you know, circling all the way back that. to kind of how we started this conversation talking about Mississippi, I mean, you know, I think part of the reason that Mississippi and Alabama, you know, have such deep, rich cultures that we have is because we've always allowed a lot of time for hunters to get into the woods. And that, mm -hmm. you know, that builds those memories and those experiences and, and you know, fosters the, the rise of that culture that, that produces some of the household hunting names that, you know, mm -hmm. come out of our two states. So, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's something that I think you definitely got to got to be aware of and, and um be sure to, to, to try to not erode, you know, I mean, right. obviously we got to be sensitive to the biology and the sustainability of the resource. Uh, but you know, we don't, we don't, we want to make sure the hunting culture is sustainable too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're inextricably linked. You have to figure out a way to balance them. What else? <laughs> Adam, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about today? Any questions that we've missed? I did want you to get some to uh, drop some pins on some of those turkeys that are not hunted very hard. You said there's, there's probably <laughs> I don't very know few. about that, man. Like I said, I think if if a turkey gobbles here in Mississippi, somebody knows about it. So. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I definitely uh, have really appreciated all this conversation, and, and you know, if there's uh, you know the, any other things that you would want to bring up or data or anything that we haven't covered that you would like to? Well, I know, I mean, I, I know you guys are having a, a much bigger uh, series of conversations about, you know, turkey science than, than this one you've had with me today, but I think it's a, like, we've hit on it kind of uh, in different ways today, but I think it's important to remember turkeys are a game bird, you know, and, and if you if you dive very deep into the game bird world, whether you're talking about turkeys or quail or grouse or any of those birds that lay a nest on the ground and have chicks that come out of the egg immediately able to feed themselves, you know, they're they're all driven by reproduction. You know, they're all dependent upon uh, those early successional habitat types to, to get through that important period. And, um, you know, turkeys are no different. And we hunt turkeys at a, at a time of the year that's a little different from a lot of those. But, but like I said a second ago, I mean, whether you're talking about quail in the southeast or you're talking about, you know, some of the prairie grouse in the Great Plains states, whether you're talking about rough grouse in the Appalachians, whether you're talking about pheasants in Kansas, you know, a lot of those species are declining and they're declining because they've lost those habitats that are important for the nesting and the brood rearing. And, you know, turkeys are dependent on the exact same thing. And so, it, you know, keep that in mind, you know, um, mm. what affects those species is probably affecting turkeys to some degree. And when it comes to those species, we, we focus a lot on habitat, you know, I mean, you, you don't hear people talking about helping pheasant populations by reducing harvest on pheasants. You talk about helping pheasant populations by increasing CRP and increasing the, the types of habitats that they that they use. And I think the same thing can be said for turkeys. You know, if there's a problem with turkeys, the, the solution at the end of the day is going to be more brood habitat on the landscape at a big scale. And yeah. that's not an easy fix, um, but that's probably the right fix. You know? Well, I think ultimately, you know, this should resonate with people that, I would much rather be able to shoot the same number of turkeys and hear more turkeys gobbling rather than to 
stabilize the population by reducing opportunity mm-hmm. to, to hear gobbling and you know harvest. I would much rather increase productivity, in other words, than decrease opportunity to stabilize the population or, or ensure that it's sustainable or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the tougher road to go down, but that yeah. doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Yeah. It's definitely harder to organize that, especially at a state level. Right. You know, uh, a concerted effort from the, the many different interests. You know, some people are living off of their land. There, there are all kinds of competing yeah. interests that, that make that difficult. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I'd much rather make more turkeys than than take less mm-hmm. so the take home is burn your woods right marcus That's- <laughs> set it on fire yeah <laughs> right we need more fire yeah fire i've definitely been i've done my fair share of promoting that but I, you know something that you said that also resonates with me and i was thinking through it a lot of our species of conservation concern and, and uh i would include turkeys into that but we've got all these species that that are benefiting from a very similar thing and to me that's as a wildlife neotropical migrant birds i mean uh, yeah we could like, we could just add layers and layers of species that people don't even know that they care yeah. about really but the thing about it is that's really cool is once you go in and start implementing that stuff and then all of a sudden you start seeing indigo bunnings and you know whatever all, all this different stuff then people start to really appreciate it and i've seen some folks get giddy about seeing some cool new yeah. tropical migrant that they never even knew they didn't have. But turkeys, part of their biology, like you're saying, uh, this limiting factor across the landscape affects positively a whole swath of species that aren't doing very well. And that definitely resonates with me. Yeah. And one of the reasons right. that I really hammer on, particularly early succession and fire and, you know, those are the things that are missing in the landscape that aren't just affecting turkeys, but this whole suite of, of other species. Right. And, and I mean, you know, to wrap all that up, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, about the effect that harvests may or may not have on reproduction. And, you know, we, we kind of touched on it. There's a lot of there's a lot of work being done right now to sort of evaluate that hypothesis and, and, mm-hmm. and, and see how much validity there is to it. So there's some uncertainty with that. But we know for sure that if a hen hatches off a nest and she has to travel a mile and a half to get to brood habitat, those poles aren't going to make it. Yeah, you know? We dead. know that. That's been well demonstrated with a lot of research already. So that's a that's a solution that mm-hmm. that we know can have positive results if you can you know burn your woods, do the right sort of habitat manipulations to get brood habitat out there. You're going to increase reproduction. It's mm-hmm. going to happen. So you know keep that in mind yeah and decrease predation and at multiple life phases and everything else that goes along with that too Mm -hmm. it's a whole cascade yeah yeah improve habitat and you decrease predation and potentially maintain our predation right (laughs) or or increase it did you pay adam to say that about habitat at the end (laughs) no i didn't (laughs) <laughs> it is a common theme, though, and that you know we we've we've addressed it directly already yeah. on several episodes. That biologists often default to this habitat role, but it's because it has this disproportionately huge effect, and it often is sort of like pulling the lever on all these other factors at the same time. Right. Right. Something that uh, I, I think I'll repeat it because I think it's a really good line that came from Craig and uh, you may not have heard about it, Adam, but uh, so I don't know if it'll be a surprise to you or not, but a substantial proportion of the nest in their study, and I think it was 10 or 12%, what was it? 12%? Maybe? 12%. Uh, they were losing to mowing. Wow. And I was I mean, thinking, yeah, what? I'm surprised it was that high. Wow. That's, I think yeah. it. I think it's because it's in that very pastoral landscape in South Central Tennessee. Yeah, yeah it was. It, yeah, he he described the landscape and and uh, I forget what it was now. It was probably fifty percent open. Something like thirty five, I think. Well, I'm talking about when you add all of them up. I okay. think thirty five okay. was how much Maybe was so. pasture. Maybe so. But anyway, large portion of the landscape was very open, but uh, mowing was prevalent. And I know that we 
all work with plenty of folks that they could, they just need to get on the tractor and mow. Recreational mowers. Yeah, yeah recreational so that's, an easy, mowers. that's an easy fix, right? Just Well, that's what you know, I was saying. Hold, if hold, I, off, hold off the bush hogging until July, right? I, that's what I was saying. If I could, if I told you that we could, uh, we could increase nesting success by 10 or 15% by saving you time and money. Most people be on that. <laughs> but then I don't get the, like the other thing that, the other thing that comes to, to my head on that too is that if if you know if those birds are are nesting in pastures, then that's probably indicative of what the state of the woods are. You know, the woods yeah. probably don't have a whole lot well, of yeah. success well, in them Yeah, that's a great point. And we we had him give the specific numbers on that, which aligned with the numbers from a South Carolina study that came out recently. Uh it was the the things that the turkeys were selecting the the highest for nesting was about seven percent of the landscape, if I recall. Yeah, three percent early succession and and four percent. Yeah, the cover type that is driving selection the most in the models that they have evaluated is the least prevalent cover yeah. type on the landscape. Yeah, I think it was seven percent of the landscape was forty something percent of the nest. Yeah, seven percent of the landscape driving like ninety ish percent of the model weight. Yeah. Wow. Which is pretty telling. And it was also the seven, part of that 7% is what everybody's looking at. Like, oh, I need to go mow that. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. And, I, and I, I mean, if you still just have to drive around your tractor, believe it or not, you can drive it without the bush hog hooked <laughs> up still. <laughs> well, I've always, or, with the, or with the PTO turned uh, yeah, off. <laughs> I've always said, you can still drive the tractor. Let's just hook something different up to it. <laughs> There you go. Something other than the mower. Maybe a sprayer or, you know. A <laughs> what about a chicken litter spreader? <laughs> well, according to their, they didn't, uh, they, he talked about the disease stuff as well, and they, they don't have very strong evidence for disease problems. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm being well, facetious, everybody. I, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to take that little clip out and put it on social media. It'll go viral. Okay. <laughs> Maybe just a sprayer full of water and you can just go water your plants. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I mean, I'm sure we could think of something better. Yeah, that. probably so. <laughs> Maybe well, a disc. Or... There you go. So, well, Adam, I know that you're a busy guy and you're trying to keep keep tabs on at the state level and the resources very dear to us. So, uh we appreciate you taking time to talk to us and and uh you know tell us about the state of turkeys in in your state so yeah really and appreciate i appreciate that. the opportunity we'll have to all get in the turkey woods together sometime yeah, absolutely it's it really good to get that state agency perspective too we appreciate it yeah yeah we really wanted to to get that you know that part of the story in. so thanks for that good deal awesome well, thanks guys yeah. thank you all right well, thanks everybody for listening in. Wild Turkey Science is sponsored by Turkeys for Tomorrow and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. For more information, follow us on social media linked in the show notes below.